Hey, so I know we normally have Friday focus episodes on Fridays, but this week we just had some hiccups and could not get one made for you. So instead, we are reposting one of our most popular episodes from a few months ago, which is with Tara Fernandez, who does a deep dive into marketing strategy and how her and her husband, Billy, make insanely huge profits with their marketing strategy as a small team in a very competitive market in Dallas, Texas. So this is one of our most favorite episodes that we have had over the past few months. A ton of you guys loved it when it first came out. If you are new to the show, this will definitely be one that you want to listen to one or two times and you will glean a lot from it. So anyways, guys, I apologize for the repost, but enjoy this show with Tara Fernandez. I think my most humble brag, and you're probably trying to go more towards wholesale deals, which wholesale deals you can have really big checks, right? Which we've gotten a few of those. But I think my most favorite is the storage facility that we own. Because remember, like my whole goal from the very beginning was passive income, right? That that was my end all be all was I want a passive income. So that way I could sit back and do whatever I wanted, whenever I wanted. Mm -hmm. So this storage deal we got actually from the owner sold us one of his duplexes and just created a relationship with Billy, really liked him. And the guy was retiring. Um, and he had a storage facility and he was like, hey, you you want to buy it? And we were like, yeah, probably. So we purchased it and super long story short, we stabilized everything. And now it's producing like, I think like $8,000 a month in passive income just to Billy and I. So that's awesome. That one's probably my favorite. Welcome to the Collecting Keys Real Estate Investing Podcast with your host, Mike DeHaan and Dan Austin. From wins, losses, horror stories, and tactics for optimizing your business, Mike and Dan take a real, uncensored deep dive into the ins and outs of running a full-time real estate investment and wholesaling business. What is going on, guys? On this episode of the Collecting Keys Real Estate Investing Podcast, we have Tara Fernandez who is a savage, like, honestly, man. I don't know. Yeah, I was going to say, there's just one word, (laughs) savage, (laughs) out there just crushing it. Yeah, so she's super awesome. She's built, her and her husband have built such an impressive real estate wholesaling business down in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And it's funny, she's very reserved and she's very humble in kind of what they've built. And I know a lot about her business, we know her personally, and I really had to encourage her to start dropping the, the secret nugs of what they've done. But man, when they come out kind of at the end of the show, it's like next level. It is next level. You got to, well, I would listen, I'm going to listen to this show multiple times. If you should listen to this show two or three times, just the knowledge bombs throughout of like how you run a wholesale business. I mean, it's amazing. It is. Yeah. And and the thing that they come such a quick period of time, they literally went from not really being in real estate to leaving their W-2s within nine months of starting their business. And it's not a rags to riches story. I hate, you know, Mike and I, we, we hate on those. It's not a rags to riches story. But she kind of logically steps through how they did it. It's a step-by-step yeah. step process how they did that. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, they, they quit their W-2 after nine months. After 14 months, they were doing seven figures. Now they're doing multi-seven figures. Like it is just crazy. And just the, the way that they go about it, they have a lean team, they move fast, they are all into the fine details and they are really, really crushing it. So Definitely enjoy this show, you guys. And hit up Tara as well on Instagram. She's both some good stuff and she's very friendly and happy to chat with you for any questions that you have. So anyways, guys, thanks so much for listening to this. If you enjoy the show, if you have anyone that's interested in wholesaling real estate at all, share this with them. Like, I don't know who wouldn't enjoy this show. Even if you don't really care about real estate, just like the stuff that she says is super applicable to any sort of business that you're trying to run. Absolutely. So go ahead and share it with anyone who might find it interesting. If you leave us a five-star review, wherever you listen to your podcast and you send me a, a DM of the screenshot of that, I might underscore invest. The first five people to do that, I'm going to send them a t-shirt, a collecting keys t-shirt. If you haven't seen those, you can see them on various of our YouTube videos, but they're pretty sick. They're nice shirts. They make your yeah. arms look good, guy or they girl. They do. They do. They, they, they make you look fit. So go and leave us a five-star review on uh, wherever you listen to your show and DM me that screenshot and I will send you a shirt for free. And aside from that, guys, enjoy the show. And uh, I feel like I need something else to finish off now because I kind of went on a tangent here. Just say enjoy. Have a good enjoy. day. Enjoy. <laughs> enjoy the show. Thanks so much, guys. Enjoy the show with Tara Fernandez. 
What's going on, guys? On this episode of the Collecting Keys Real Estate Investing Podcast, we have a good friend of ours, Tara Fernandez, out of the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And Tara, she came through a mastermind that Dan and I, I guess, originally started with. And her and her husband have built what I would say is like the most impressive business just in terms of what they've done with a really lean operation. It's mostly just them. Up until super recently, they were making big money, doing a lot of deals, and have just done some really, really awesome things that I think everyone sort of strives to do. And they've learned a lot of lessons along the way that would be super relatable to anybody that wants to run an off-market wholesaling business. So Tara, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. Super pumped to be here. You really, you puffed us up a bit. So got some good. <laughs> it's all true. It's all true though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's all true. I'm just saying the expectations. Now you can't let everyone down, you know, but uh, so, and I'll also say our first female guest too, which I'm, I'm super stoked about because that's one thing that I found about this space that's really, I mean, it is a, a good old boys club for the most part, which is unfortunate, but that uh, I feel like that's a changing bit. a little bit. Yeah. There's some women breaking through. Yeah, yeah. You have, you know, proven that it doesn't need to be that way with how you've how you've run your business. So yeah, and I think it's just historically more male dominant, yeah. and more and more women are coming. It's kind of fun to just see them and be like, hey, <laughs> I can relate to you. <laughs> hey, I'm so, here too. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you and you can go into the I guess the male dominated conversations, be like, oh, your business is so cute. Yeah, I do exactly. like ten times <laughs> as much as you, so that makes it even better. I can't hit their ego too hard. I got to play with them a little bit. But. Yeah. For, yeah, for now, for now. But awesome. Well, anyway, so yeah, thanks for coming on. I'd love to hear just sort of about, you know, your backstory, what you were doing before you got into this business and, you know, how things have sort of grown and come together. Yeah, for sure. I had a very normal kind of early career. I went to college at very you know, safe, normal school, went to undergrad and then grad school. I did what everyone told me to do, you know, go to a good school to get a good job. So I got a marketing job in a healthcare IT company and worked there pretty much all through my 20s in different companies, just all healthcare IT related. And it got to a point, I married my husband. We moved from California to Texas and we were both traveling a lot for work. He was he was also in the healthcare medical supply side and we were just traveling a ton for work. And it was it was wearing on me to where I was like, you know, like this is if and when we do plan to have kids, like I don't want to have to travel and miss their soccer games and, you know, all the things so it kind of got my head thinking, what are some other things that I can do to replace my income? So originally, I just wanted rentals. And I was thinking, okay, if I collect five or 10 rentals over the next five years, then I can have enough passive income to kind of offset my regular job. Maybe I can get like a side job that allows me to stay at home. That was the original intention was I just wanted a couple of rentals. So that way I didn't have to travel so much for work. And then that kind of snowballed a little bit Just a little bit to where I started learning. Yeah, I started learning a little bit about real estate. I read the Burr book, which kind of got my wheels turning into, oh my gosh, I don't have to like scrape and save, you know, 20, 30 grand over two, three years to then just like push it all into one house and then start over and, you know, that that whole thing. And then we found this this mastermind that we're all a part of back two, two years ago, I believe. Uh -huh. And it was mainly about wholesaling. And I was like, I don't need to wholesale. I just want rentals. But what was kind of sold me was you keep the best and we'll sell the rest. And that line totally resonated with me. It's like, okay, if I'm going to spend the money on all this marketing to find these deals and I don't want to keep those deals, I might as well make money since I've spent the money on marketing. Yep. So yeah. That kind of went from there and and the rest is history. We did pretty good on it. Yeah. The rabbit. Yes. The rest is history. You make you get humble on the crazy parts. But <laughs> I mean, I, I think what you're saying though is is super relatable to a lot of people because that's how Dan and I started as well. We wanted to buy rentals. I mean, even before Dan and I started working together, both of our original intentions were just to buy rentals. Yep. And wholesaling wasn't even on the radar. It wasn't even a thing. It wasn't even an option at that time. <laughs> Yeah. 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 But as you start to learn about it, like kind of like you said, 
it takes so long to recycle your money doing the burr method. So then you kind of come to the epiphany of, oh, well, if I find, if I know how to find opportunities and I can monetize those, I can scale so much quicker, you know, by, by making the quick money, by being a wholesaler or doing, you know, quick flips and things like that. And that's something that a lot of people don't realize. Yeah. Yeah, that and you're in the trenches so much more uh-huh. than just collecting a couple of houses a year. Like you, you're you getting to know all of the buyers in the area. You're getting to know your bankers, your title officers, and then they get to know your name. And that just kind of compounds quicker by wholesaling. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. You're, really getting, you're walking so many more properties. You're doing so many more things at volume because that's the nature of the business that you become an expert. And then it's kind of funny, like, then buying rentals, like Mike and I were talking this, talking about this with our group last night in our in our call, which is like how we look at properties and analyze properties. I bet how you re- analyze a rental property now is just so much different than when you, before you started wholesaling, like it's just so much easier and so much more experience. It's just like, oh yeah, yeah, we're going to burn this property. It's going to do this, oh, yeah. it's going to do that. And, it, and if it doesn't do it this way, it's okay because we've got a ton more properties. Oh yeah. yeah, I we had the uh, bigger pockets calculator <laughs> that like was saved on my desktop, and like I would yep. plug that all in, and I would redo it three, four different times because I just yep. like, I didn't know. And now you just all yep. you do it in your head in you Absolutely. know sixty seconds, and you're like, yep, that's a deal, yep. or nope, that's a deal, or whatever. Yeah, that, that's so funny. That's literally the conversation we had last night. One of the guys in our instant investor he literally had like a calculator he got from Redfin. He was like, so. How do you guys analyze this? And we're like, honestly, dude, I don't know. It's nuanced, so nuanced. Like, yeah. We just don't yeah. even think this way anymore. Yeah, it, it yeah. depends. <laughs> yeah, yep. it's just programmed. Yeah, yeah, but cool. So, I mean, you say the rest is history, but like what what is your past couple of years, I guess, looked like as, you know, you started to grow this business? Because I'll remember when you and Billy, um, when I first met you guys, you guys were heading out to Whitefish, Montana, and you came and you made a stop in in Spokane and we went and had lunch. And you guys had like just started and you were talking about the numbers that you were throwing up. And I was sitting there going, what the fuck? You're like, we don't do that. That's not fair. Like, the, <laughs> I was like, I was like, these have been doing this for like two months. You know, after Dan and I have been going for two months, we were just in <laughs> massive debt with nothing to show for it. But you guys had been piecing it. You guys were piecing together in a couple of months what had taken us, you know, a year and a half at that point to be doing. Yeah, we, I think it just, I think a lot of it has to do with just our, partnership so when i say we it's my husband and i and in this is our team um at least for the first year and a half of this business it was just him and i and we knew our roles really yeah. well from the get-go just because yeah. we know each other right we're married we know what yeah. our strengths and weaknesses are and he's naturally good at sales and connecting with people the man can talk to a wall. He'll talk to anyone. He's great at it. <laughs> and then I'm more um, marketing. I have a marketing background. That's what I did in my day job. So I think we just, it naturally clicked at least a little bit right off the bat. So it didn't take us as many months to just kind of like get our bearings. So I want to make a point of clarification here too. When we're talking like marketing, so it sounds like you guys are match made in heaven for this business because you got sales with Billy. You have you with marketing. When you say marketing, do you... You know, I think a lot of people confuse that with like flashy infographics and stuff like that. What I think about it is like the analytics behind it. So do you find that that was a leg up for you or that that's where you're specializing? And that's what you're talking about when you say marketing? Yeah, I'm I'm a very analytical person. So I like to look back on my data and see what's working and what's not, because I'm not going to spend money on something that's flashy, but doesn't earn me any money. Like, why would I do that? Uh, so yeah. um, I definitely like, I mean, much like you guys, I like looking at, you know, the data and the pieces of information and and then making a marketing totally. off yep. of that. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, so I guess, you know, what Isaiah said too, Match Made in Heaven, you, you kind of had the two pieces that most people typically struggle to find. I think that's one of the reasons you were so successful is, you know, you had the sales and you had the analytical side. So a lot of people that we connect with um, or that we've met that are or in different groups, they'll yeah. have one or the other. Like they're like have a real estate background, they're super good at sales, but they can't manage an Excel spreadsheet to save their life, you yeah. know, or they're kind of on the other end of the spectrum where they're, you know, very analytical, they're good at the spreadsheet, they understand how to run the numbers, but you try to get them talking to a seller and they're just like completely useless, right? Right. Um, you know, and that was honestly kind of where we started when when we were getting going. So Yeah, and learning and just knowing what your strengths are mm-hmm. and finding a partner that complements your strengths. We got lucky in just the fact that we were married and we wanted to do this right. together. Like, so 
I think there was probably a little bit of luck involved on that one. But yeah, yeah. so we took probably three to four months when we in 2020 to identify what market we were going to go to, build our brand, figure out what we were going to name it, you know, just kind of the building of your business. And then uh-huh. we dropped our first uh, round of mailing. We do all, most of our marketing is through direct mail marketing. So we dropped our first round of letters in December of 2020 and got a deal off that right off the bat. It was a small little wholesale deal. Nice. I think we, I think we got like, it was like $8,000 or something like that for, for our first one. But we were like, oh, it worked. It's like almost our exact same. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah like right. it, proven or at least like this go around it worked so since we got that deal we dropped another you know a couple thousand letters got another deal and it kind of just started compounding on itself Uh so we kind of moved from the mindset of okay this this works this isn't just like throwing spaghetti at a wall to okay now this that this works so well can we quit our day jobs and go full-time at that so that was kind of our next goal that we had in mind of can we have this replace our income and do yeah. this full time? So we ended up doing that in like nine months. Nine months. That's that's amazing. And what did your business, I guess, look like at that point in that decision? Like, you know, what was your deal flow? I mean, I know it was you guys doing all the work at that point, but like honestly, how much money you were making were you making if you don't mind sharing that? Because I think that's always good context for people. Yeah. Um, I was trying to remember. So I think we have four different, I guess, criteria in order for us to quit our jobs. It was, we had to have our emergency fund of six to nine months of reserves essentially built up. So that was the goal. I think we had to have three months of consistent deals. And at the time we were making at our day jobs, I think we brought home after taxes like 12000 a month. So that we just had to uh-huh. basically match that. The third one, oh, and we had to just agree on like a partnership between Billy and I that this was a good, good time to quit. Like we didn't Mm -hmm. want to have one person on the page. He wanted to quit like two months ahead of time. And of course me, you know, I think women are naturally more like conservative on like, you know, jumping out and risk and that kind of thing. So I was more just like, no, we've got to be on the same page on the month that we both quit. Right. Yeah, I love how you guys, I remember you explaining that when we were all in Florida together masterminding and you all, ex, you and Billy explained kind of your process. And I love it because you had a very reasonable approach and you didn't continue to move the targets, which is easy to do. You're like, well, we got nine months reserved. Let's just do 12. That just feels so much better. But it was very tactical. And then you actually executed on it. Like we're doing it. We met these requirements. We're doing it. And then you just went all, all in. And, and obviously the rest is history, as we say. It just makes it so much easier when you've got a defined goal. You can just work backwards from it and you don't have like that uneasy feeling of waking up in the morning and not knowing what you have to do. Sure. You're just like, no, okay, that's my, that's true north. So that's where I'm heading. Yeah. Yeah. I think yeah, that's, that's super valid. So you said the three, was there a fourth one too that you were going to mention? You said that. There was, and I'm trying to think about it, but I'm blinking, which is not good. Yeah. I'm sure it'll come I mean, to me. It, it, it's fine. At this point, you guys are in such a different spot than you were back then anyway. It's, it is sometimes hard to remember basic stuff like that. But uh, no, so that, that's, that's cool. So you quit nine months after you started. So that would have been, what, September of 2021 about? It was June of 2021 when we put in our notice. Nice. So Awesome. Cool. So, so now we're out 18 months ahead of that. And I guess let's even just get a high overview of what all have you guys accomplished with your business? What does it look like right now? And, you know, what is like, I guess, like the big picture of just like your whole everything? Because I know it's very, very different from even when we last saw you last November. Sure. So we just kind of like the big, like fun, cool things in the first, I think the first 14 months of creating the business, we hit seven figures. Nice. Nice. And it was just Billy and I. I did have a VA at the time that would help me with some marketing stuff. So super small, lean, lean team. And I've always wanted to have a a small team just because I don't need a huge team. Even in our goals in the next couple of years, it's not going to be a very big team. And then this year has all been about focusing, obviously, on keeping, you know, our deals up, but also building our team out. So 
like the beginning, we've got our AM that we hired in August, and then we hired a lead manager to a month and a half ago. And then we're actively looking for our second AM to hire here before the end of the year. So this year we were on pace to hit what we did last year. Actually, we're double, double the amount nice. um, from last year. Sorry, not the same. Double the amount. Is that d- yeah. double in revenue or in deals? In revenue. So yeah. our, okay. our deals, interestingly enough, our deals have actually gone down. Our just mm-hmm. revenue per deal has wow. gone way up. Um, we had a couple of big, big deals. Well, I also in there, wonder but, too, with those big yeah. deals, yeah. like, do you think that comes with experience where you're like, I know the value of this. And so uh, you're willing to find the right buyer for the value of something, or do you think it's just luck? I think it's more about knowing the buyer and knowing your worth. I think there's a combination of that and kind of knowing like where you can put, push your you okay. know, MAO and where you can start, you know, your baseline of where you're starting with the offer. I also think it depends on the deal too. Like most of our really, really big six figure wholesale deals have come off commercial or land deals. Just because you're, you know, your percent that you're getting off of that deal is the same percentage as a single family, but that just the dollar amount is bigger. So you're getting paid more. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think that is super, super valid. And like looking back, you guys have had some crazy huge deals that you'll dive into in just a second. But I think that view of kind of knowing what your buyers want, though, is is really important. It's something that a lot of people tend to overlook. And honestly, even Dan and I, we struggle with this where we tend to look at deals from what we would want to buy them for and not necessarily what someone else would want to buy them for. And we've for definitely sure. missed opportunities because of that, right? Yeah. But I think it's sort of getting out of our own way of like thinking that we need to be able to purchase everything ourselves isn't true. I know from talking to Billy, he's taken a really aggressive approach towards that, especially with some of like the land and the commercial stuff that you guys have done huge deals on. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess one thing I will say with that, it definitely helps being in Dallas, Dallas Fort Worth, which is such a huge area, has so much economic development just going on with with big money doing stuff. But uh, you mean either way, it's no, I know, like making those connections mm-hmm. is still equally challenging. So yeah, and that's something that we're actually putting a lot more focus in. Are focusing on our buyer relationships, especially as this market you know has gone wonky and it's changing more into a buyer's market. We're putting a huge emphasis on cultivating our existing relationships with buyers? How do we get more, you know, additional new relationships with newer buyers or buyers that we don't know yet? So that's going to be a really big focus here for us, at least the, in the upcoming and how, months. How do you go about that? I know it's, it's easier yeah. said than yeah. done. Like you're saying, cultivate with existing and new relationships. Is there anything specific you are doing to do that? Yeah. So we have a goal of every week Billy holds these Mm -hmm. relationships, right? Because he's the sales guy. Um, But every week he either goes and has coffee or lunch with two buyers. Again, just kind of keeping us top of mind. We've got these Christmas cards that I'm I'm putting out here for the next couple of weeks for our buyers. Again, just top of mind, just because, you know, we're one of a bunch. So we just need to stand Mm -hmm. out somehow. That and, and like not only cultivating the relationship, but I also want to know like, has their buy box changed? You know, are they buying in different areas? Have you know, is the building different? Square footage different? Amount that they want to spend on a rehab? Do they want to tear down? Do they want cosmetic? What is it? That's awesome. Yeah, I think that thing top front of mind is super important, especially like we talked about as it is harder to dispo deals right now. Yep. I mean, buyers have choices, especially if they're big buyers. So they need to have a reason to buy your deal. It's not It's not like it was last year where everyone was so desperate for opportunities that you could just like sell whatever because people would just like, we're just trying to take everything that they could. Now that things are a little bit more on the rocks, buyers are being a little bit more choosy and they have to- Buyer's market. It's a buyer's market, exactly. Oh, yeah. So, you know, so they have the opportunity to be like, eh, you don't want to do that. I mean, even recently, we were trying to wholesale one with someone that was absolutely in somebody's box. And they were like, well, you have your deal or I have this other one that I like better, so I'm just not going to buy yours. I'm going to buy this other one instead. And we're like, well, that sucks, but that's the reality of the market. If you have that strong relationship with them, though, they might feel a responsibility to you because they might like doing business with you. Like you're saying, going to coffee, uh-huh. sending out Christmas cards, being top of mind, being that trustworthy provider. I mean, that that's a 
I'm smiling. So those are just some knowledge bonds right there for anybody listening to this, like how to do that. Well, and and making sure your numbers are accurate, right? Like Mm -hmm. so there have been, we're actually doing a lot more referrals now where other wholesalers will come to us with their deal that they can't push. and, And if the numbers work, we will send it to our buyers. But there's so much, you know, just people just don't know their numbers and they say their rehabs, you know, only 30 grand when in reality it's 50. And once your buyer realizes that they're not going to trust you because it's the wrong number. Yep. So they trust us because we have accurate Absolutely. Yeah. Just because you want it to be 30 grand yeah. doesn't mean it's 30 grand. <laughs> like there's a difference between want <laughs> and actual facts. Right. Right. Yeah. And that can't be overstated too for the, like the longevity of this business. You know, a lot of people, they will go and they will kind of fudge their numbers to make a quick buck. And they'll think that's a sustainable business model. Sure, you can get away with that for a little while, you know, four months, five months, if you're lucky. Then it does come back around. I mean, we've even seen that with like some of the larger companies that used to exist here in um, Spokane. They don't exist anymore because their whole business model was kind of fudging the numbers and they would do that wholesale side. Then after a while, they started to believe their own bullshit and they were were (laughs) buying their own properties with their own false numbers and lo and behold, it imploded. Surprise. <laughs> yeah. It didn't work out. Yeah. It is funny. Mike and I have looked at some of the deals our other competitors, like deals yeah. we were competing on where we're like, that. Ah, the numbers just don't work. And people that they sold them to and people you're like, they lost. And you know, because then you go and look what it sold for. You're like, oh, they lost 50 grand. They're not going to be hold. They're not going to be a, a flipper again for the next year. No. I mean, you just lost a buyer. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. So awesome. Well, I want to dive into your big deals here in just a second. But before we do, I want to just stay on your your business processes. So I know that from you being on the marketing analytics side, um, just from talking to other people that are that are in our, our same group, a lot of people have high praise for how you put together your list in the meticulous way that you do your marketing and your data. So can you give us like just a brief overview kind of, of what that looks like? And I guess any tips for people that want to be proficient at that and not waste a bunch of money on marketing? Yeah, yeah. And I get this question all the time. I'm like, oh, how do you, how do you market so well? I'm like, honestly, it's super simple because I can't complicate things. My little blonde <laughs> head, it, it won't go well. So like, I have to keep things super simple. I'm just super consistent. Like, all I do is every Monday, on Mondays I market. So I will pull pull the list that I need to pull that week, depending on, you know, what what deals are going well, what deals are closing, uh, those types of lists, do I need to remarket to that? And I just pull them on Mondays and I do it weekly. I know some people do it monthly, which works for them. But I know I'm either going 110 miles an hour or I'm the laziest person ever. So I just put a calendar invite on my calendar. And on Mondays, I remind myself, okay, this is when I need to pull my list. So that's in a nutshell what I do. Yeah. And then the types of lists I pull, the stuff that works for us the most and has been the last couple of years are just high equity lists. It's nothing crazy exciting. You know, we do market to niche lists, but that's not like our bread and butter. Niche lists I've actually found aren't doing as well right now just because, you know, people don't have as much money to market with. So what do they do? They go to the niche list because they're small lists. You don't have to spend as much money. So all of those houses are getting nailed with everybody. Um, so we don't actually, you know, see as many deals that way just because everyone's getting hit by that. Getting hit by it. Yeah. And you say just uh, high equity is that absentee owners or is that just like all high equity? It's both high equity, absentee, owner occupied. We've kind of, if you want to like narrow it down, we've narrowed it down based on the year built. Right. So we do everything that's older than 2015 and then square footage. So we don't want massive houses. Uh, we don't run in that space. So anything that's 2,200 square feet and smaller. So th- those are like my filters, if you will. But Sweet. I like it. And then for data, you just using prop stream, you know, real yeah, flow. Yeah, deal machine, deal machine, prop stream, list source. They each yeah. have their own little, you know, quirks about it. So I'm not devoted to one just because... They all are different in their own way. So kind of pull depending each one. Yeah. And then to compile all that, do you use 
Do you have like a giant complex spreadsheet or what do you use? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> I use ReSift, so, or REI Sift, and that's where I house all of my data. That's how I keep everything organized um, with the number of lists that I've got. I have a whole tagging system. So I know, okay, I've mailed this, you know, these 15,000 records in October. So I'm not going to mail them again in November. Or maybe I am going to mail them again in October because they hit my, you know, certain parameters that I want to be able to be top of mind every month. And that uh, Recif just keeps it super easy by being able to tag things and know when I've mailed and what I've mailed. If I've mailed a postcard versus a letter versus right. something else. Yeah. And what you just said right there is what I was trying to push you towards. Because I know that you do that. <laughs> I felt, felt it. it. I felt it. <laughs> and that that is, like, you can't emphasize enough because that is so... I guess like impressive how you sort of built out that system of, you know, that meticulous way that you go through and you look at those little details, right? Because like, like you said, the person, like people can go and pull like the bankruptcy list and they it's actually a low on budget, they just mail that. But you're actually going through and you're reviewing your data based off different criteria based on when you mailed them, if they still fit your criteria, you look for those little nuances and you basically create your own niche list doing that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that that is the secret sauce that I don't even necessarily know if you realize that you have. And when people reach out to you and they say, what are you doing? That's what they want to hear. But here's the crazy thing is you can tell them exactly that. And they'll be like, ah, that sounds too hard. I don't know if I can do that. <laughs> and it, exactly. And that's why you will continue to be more successful than that person. Well, and then really, it really is just very boring work, right? It's not, it it's nothing flashy. Like I'm sitting there with, you know, all the data. And I think one of the things, too, that people tend to overlook, and I tend to overlook it, too, just because you're just busy with life, is uh -huh. the, you know, looking back at what's worked. So pulling, yeah. you know, if you've closed whatever 10 deals over the last 30 days, pull that information and figure out, OK, where did those records come from? Is there a list that they've all come from? And remail that, send them in a postcard versus, you know, a mailer or a letter or, or something different or give them a cold call because that list happens to be working sure. right now. It may not work in another three, four months. It'll switch to a different list, which is fine. You just have to like stay on top of what's working. Wow. Yep. And that is, I think, like the sign of a good marketer, right? You have your key performance indicators, your KPIs that you're tracking, how many deals you're closed, where they came from. You're testing it, right? You're retesting it with a different kind of marketing. You're comparing what worked and what didn't, and you're being consistent. And I think that testing, that retesting, and that consistency, and then having a tracking mechanism yep. is really, really powerful. And in being agile, like you said, sometimes lists stop working for three months, in, in three or four months, and you gotta, you have to be agile to switch to something else and keep doing what Mike is saying, test and retest and keep moving forward. Yeah, yeah, because mar I mean, marketing is just. It's as much an art as it is a science, right? Like you uh -huh. sometimes you have to throw stuff up and see what sticks. And that's the scary part that people don't want to spend money on. But yeah. you have to if you want to grow. And then all the while still grooming the stuff you know yep. that is working. I know Mike and I joke and like, like you've put a you put a system around what Mike and I call the moon cycles. Like, I don't know, just the different moon cycles that at least hit hard this time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But that awesome. That's great stuff, Tara. That's it's really, really awesome. And you know, if anybody is listening to this, go and re listen yeah. to that section. Cause honestly, the little nuance that she does there, if you're unclear on those, like you well, we'll get Tara's information after after the show, but go and reach out to her and just like ask for any sort of clarifications because that is seriously the magic of being very, very successful in this business with a small team is knowing how for to do sure. details like that. So super cool. Awesome. So as we start to sort of round up here, before we get into our, our final questions, let's hear your humble brags on the big deals you guys have done. Because you guys have done some of the most impressive deals that I've ever heard of. Oh, gosh. <laughs> humble brags. Um, honestly, I think my most humble brag, and you're probably trying to go more towards wholesale deals, which wholesale deals, you can have really big checks, right? Which uh -huh. we've gotten yeah. a few of those. But I think my most favorite is the storage facility that we own because Remember, like my whole goal from the very beginning was passive income, right? That that was my end all be all was I want a passive income. So that way I could sit back and do whatever I wanted, whenever I wanted. Mm -hmm. So this storage deal we got actually from 
the owner sold us one of his duplexes and just created a relationship with Billy, really liked him. And the guy was retiring um, and he had a storage facility and he was like, hey, you you want to buy it? And we were like, yeah, probably. So a little we, bit. yeah, a little bit, a little bit. And so we just kind of walked through the numbers and knowing nothing about storage. Like this is our first commercial deal. And we just kind of figured out, okay, what are the rents in the area? Um, can we compare that? Is there some sort of gap between what people are renting out the units for and what they're currently renting it out for? And and there was, there was a major gap. So we purchased it and super long story short, we stabilized everything and now it's producing like, I think like $8,000 a month in passive income just to Billy and I. So that's awesome. That, awesome. that one's probably my favorite, but a hundred thousand dollars a year in passive income. You can't hate that off one. And then the tax, off one, you yeah. know, the tax depreciation on that, they're paying off my mortgage, which we owner financed it through the guy. So he's also getting mailbox money. So total Ooh. win-win. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Awesome. That's huge. That's the kind of asset that every buy and hold investor strives for. Yes. Yeah. But it's a legacy property right there. It is. But just mm-hmm. because I'm a I'm a meathead, I have to go with like the wholesale equivalent of what's your bench question. What's your exactly. what's your biggest deal? What am I benching right now? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the gym question. Right? What do you bench, bro? Yeah. What's your biggest wholesale check? I don't remember the exact one. It's around like three seventy. Three hundred and seventy thousand dollars from yeah. one yeah. assignment. Yeah, it was another actually storage facility deal. We decided we didn't want to keep it, so we wholesaled it. But I could tell you like a year a year ago, year and a half ago, we had our first six-figure assignment. And I was like, there's no way that's normal. Like, we're lucky to get that one. Like, that's totally right. not normal. And then like three months later, we got another one. And we're like, mm, okay, that's that's weird. And now like... If we're not getting as like, it's, it seems a little ego but it's not. If we're not getting a six-figure assignment every like handful of months, I'm actually getting a little concerned. Oh, man. Oh, yeah. It's regular. And it's just who you market to and what their motivations are and, and that kind of thing. So and your, and your buyers. That's my benching. And I don't like yeah. talking about it, but that's my benching. That's your benching. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I yeah, love it. You got a huge bench press record. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. If, if I'm not benching four plates once a month, I don't even want to count it. I'm not even that strong. <laughs> <I'll think>. but, <laughs> right? Oh, my gosh. Awesome. Well, yeah, you're, you're too humble. Seriously. Awesome. Well. This is great stuff, Tara. I really, really appreciate you going through all that. And, uh, you know, even though you don't like talking about it, I mean, that is that is really impressive. So people do want to hear it. Thank you. You earned the brag. You earned the brag You for did. Sure. Yeah, <laughs> you did. Yeah, you have a very, very big bench press. Should be proud. But uh, all right, so we're going to go into our sort of roundup questions here. And uh, the first question is the group favorite. I know you guys have some good ones, but what is your craziest real estate investing story? Craziest real estate investing story. Gosh, Billy's got all the crazy ones because I'm the dork in the closet that, that does all the data, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I would say the craziest one he came back to. So he used to run all of our appointments, right? And go meet with the sellers and all that stuff. And I remember he called me on his way back from an appointment where it was just a total meth lab. He walked into the house and and I'm going to butcher the story because he's a way better storyteller. So have him on here <laughs> and he can tell the story. As long as he promises not to tell the dog story. The dog, no. I was going to say, don't tell the dog story. <laughs> not the dog story. That's, yeah. after, that's like a Friday night after a couple of drinks. Then, then oh, we'll tell yeah. that story. But uh, <laughs> just, you know, having to deal with crazy people who had, you know, shot themselves up about five minutes beforehand and they're passed out nice. in the ground. He's got to walk over them so he can take pictures of the house. And, yeah, you know. <laughs> Silly stuff. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That yeah. sounds about right. That sounds like some of our sellers right there. Yeah. And oh, so yeah. It's the unfortunate reality of the business, right? Like, you know, you see stuff like that. It's not pretty, whether it's, you know, a homeowner that is having problems with, you know, with drugs themselves, or a lot of times we get like landlords that have tenants that are causing the sort of issues. And, yep. you know, it's just, it just, you start to see things that you never thought you would see when you get into this land of work. Oh, right? yeah. Oh, yeah. It's it's not the the sexy chip and Joanna Gaines. 
So, no, no, no. You're the one. You're the one getting that. So Chip and Joanna Gaines can do their property. You gotta, you gotta right. get the crackheads out of there first. Yeah, right. yeah, <laughs> yeah, d- yeah. Just, just funny, funny side tangent story. I think you'd enjoy this. We had a guy on um, about a month ago that uh, he does like new builds and mm-hmm. uh, like high end new builds. And his one of his builds was on like the love it or list it or like one of those like a house hunters. Oh yeah. It was uh, it was by flipping Boston or something was one of them. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, well, the whole premise of the show was that you know you have like the homeowners that go and like pick the house, and uh, you know they like was like, oh, we don't like this one because X Y Z. This is the one that we want. But he said that they had already bought the house like eight months before they came to film the show. What? And like literally, they they showed up and they walked through like two pretend listings, well, two listings, and pretended like they were looking at them. But they'd already bought the one that was like presented in the show. And he yeah. said the thing though that was so stupid was they put this big emphasis on like, wow, they did such a good job staging. Look at how they put this couch here. And it's like, he's like, that's your couch. That's, that's your literally couch. your that's, couch. That's why you, you like, like that, that couch. couch. Yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh my gosh. Um, I didn't know that. Yeah, it's all just okay. BS. And yeah, and then he said that after they, they did, he did two episodes of his houses. And then they started asking him about being on like a house flipping show. And after he sort of told them about the business, they're like, oh, that sounds like it has way too much drama for us. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. So, so they they don't yeah. even want the real story. That's so but, funny. Um, yeah, that was uh, Damon Amato. His, his episode came out uh, probably about a month before this one, so you should definitely go back and, and listen to that if anyone wants to hear that. But uh, awesome. So second question: uh, What is one piece of advice you would have for a new investor looking to get started, or a small investor looking to take their business to the next level? I would just say be consistent. You know, none of us are geniuses. We're just more consistent than the average person. Consistent Uh in your lead follow-up, consistent in whatever marketing tactics you decide to do, just be consistent on them. You know, not everything works right out of the gate. And especially the small business owner, you you try things and then they break and then you try things again. And then, of course, they'll break. So I just say be consistent on it. Yeah, I think I love that. You got to show up every day. Exactly. Yeah. When you're like worried to push the button, like Mike and I went through that, right? Do we push the button again? The marketing button? Do we do it again? We're not feeling super good about it. And you do it, you keep doing it. And then money rolls back in and you're, that's why you're still here today. Right. Right. Well, and building a team too, right? Like you're, this is your baby that's learned that like you were holding for a while and now it's starting to learn how to walk and you're like, okay, well, like this is my baby. Please take care of it kind of thing. Yeah. So, but you have to. Yeah, and that is the most important thing. And like you said, this we're not all geniuses. This business isn't rocket science. And there are very few business models that literally a, a couple or even an individual could do the same thing, could go from getting started to making seven figures in 14 months with no real experience in the business mm-hmm. beforehand. Like that is, you know, people who have other businesses, whether it's like a trade business or they're selling widgets or things like that. They spend literally years and years trying to get to seven figures worth of revenue. Right, trying to figure yeah. that out. You know, and this just because the size of the transactions and the way that, you know, the business kind of works, you can do that in a very short period. And you can do it with high profit margins. Like you guys had a, you still have a lean team, but starting out, you had a very lean team, two people, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, those profit margins are incredible. Insane. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. So last question, where can people find you, follow you or reach out to you if you'd like them to do so? Yeah, they can find me on Instagram, just Tara underscore Ferns, F-E-R-N-S. Perfect. Easy. Yeah, easy enough. Easy. Easy peasy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks so much for coming on, Tara. It's been great. And uh, did, did you? I just realized I haven't seen your name wrong the entire time. It's actually Tara. Oh, that's okay. The year, it, it's fine. I had a boss. Mike I does that to I all feel guests. terrible now. Uh, no, no. <laughs> No, don't feel I've known bad. you for a while. I know. I've literally bad. said your name wrong the whole time. I had a boss for like probably five years. I worked for him for five years. And like the first and like his kids went to school with my youngest brother. Like, so we were like pretty connected. And I, I remember correcting him like the first couple of months that I knew him. And then by the time like year four rolled around, it's like, you can call me whatever you want. And doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> it's rough, funny. Well, either way, I apologize. I'm embarrassed about that now. No. So I'm going to leave that in there. I'm wondering where you got Tara from. I just kind of left it alone. I was like, that's I, kind of a weird way to say it. Uh, yeah. Get out of here, Dan. You're just trying to jump on the, the bandwagon. I never of, making to, me to, eat to, it. All right. Thank you, Tara. Thank you for Tara for coming uh, on today. Yeah, yeah whatever. <laughs> oh, man. But <laughs> It's Mike. I forgive you. 
Yeah. Yeah. Fetty. So we call him Mick around here. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> Mick <laughs> DeHane. <laughs> uh, anyways, well, thanks, Tara, for coming That's on the show. We do really wonderful. appreciate it. So much good stuff. And if you guys want to reach out to her, go ahead and hit her up on Instagram. She posts a lot of great stuff on there as well. She, she really is a wealth of knowledge. Besides that, you guys, if you want to learn how to create an off-market opportunity generating business like Dan and I have and like Tara has, go and check out instantinvestorprogram.com and we'll see if you're a good fit. We're going to have a bunch of new offerings up there right now as well. So if you go to instantinvestorprogram.com, you can see all the different programs that we currently offer for you. Aside from that, guys, thanks so much for listening and talk to you guys next week. See ya. Thanks for listening, everybody. Please make sure you subscribe and leave us a five-star review wherever you listen to your podcasts. Also, please make sure you go and you share this with other people within your network. We are really trying to grow this thing and the best way for us to do so is by you telling other people to come check us out. You can also follow us on Instagram. I am at Mike underscore invest. Dan is at Investor Man Dan. You can follow the podcast at Collecting Keys Podcast. And if you want to learn how to make real money as a real estate investor, or you want to grow your already existing real estate investing business, please go and check out instantinvestorprogram.com and book a call with either Dan or myself, and we will see if you'll be a good fit. Thanks for listening, everybody, and talk to you next week. Thanks for listening. Please leave us a review on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. And check us out at collectingkeyspodcast.com for tips and guides on starting your own real estate investment and wholesaling business.